Good morning, everyone. We're going to begin in just about a minute's time. Hello everyone, Mike and Dave, your webinar is ready. All right, hey, good morning everyone. Thanks for tuning in. We're gonna get started here. Uh, my name is Dave Furkul. I'm here with Mike Myers. We're both consultants with OECS and we're gonna talk a bit about, you know, the health side of occupational safety and, you know, some of the methods that can be used to assess and just, you know, really cover a lot of the requirements as well, both from an occupational health standpoint, as well as environmental. And so we'll, and certainly make use of the chat box. If you do have questions, we'll try to answer them as they come. But otherwise, at the end, we'll give you a chance to also submit questions as well. And we'll try to answer them as best we can. Uh, that said, let's move on here. Um, just want to start a little bit by talking about you know this profession this that's called industrial hygiene. I mean, industrial hygiene is that profession that looks at the health side of of occupational safety. It's going to look at the health hazards, and it, the profession itself is defined as the science and art devoted to the anticipation, recognition, evaluation, and control of environmental stressors that could cause illness. You know impairment of well-being. Um, it could affect workers within the workplace or outside of the workplace. I mean, it's really looking at and assessing things that are generated within the workplace that, that could also impact outside of the workplace. So, and when we talk about, you know, anticipation, you know, we're really, really, you need to have some understanding of the work processes or at least an understanding of some of the things involved, or it might even just be, you know, for example, maybe you want, you're made aware that uh, someone's going to be bringing in a product and you learn that it's highly corrosive. Well, you're going to anticipate a potential hazard here because, hey, maybe if someone has to handle it directly, you know, there could be some issues. Um, you know, the recognition, again, you know, that's really related to getting a good understanding of the work processes as well. But um, it could just be, you know, visual cues and even verbal cues. Um, you know, if you see someone working and the task that they're performing generates a lot of emission and they're standing right in it, you know, you're probably recognizing a potential hazard there. Um, if you have difficulty talking to someone in a work environment because of the high noise, you know, you may be recognizing that, hey, this might be a little higher noise levels than, than we really want, or we may need to consider some other control measures if nothing else, at least wearing hearing protection. So, you know, those, those are the kinds, those two areas really, um, really are focused on getting a good understanding of the work. How is it performed? You know, what types of, you know, tools, equipment, machines, you know, what's involved? What types of raw materials are in use? Um, getting that good understanding of everything is what's gonna help you then to determine, hey, what, what else do we need to evaluate? You know, when we evaluate things, we may not necessarily recognize what might be a serious hazard right away. And it may require that we do some further, you know, maybe it's air monitoring or noise monitoring or something like that. Just, it gives us a better sense of, you know, do we need to focus on this and do we need to look at the possibility of in implementing some type of con further control measures? You know, the controls, they can be a lot of, a lot of different options and we'll discuss that a little more in, in depth as we go in, but you know, control measures are going to be the result of your, you know, previous assessments. And, you know, you're going to decide what's going to be best. You certainly want to involve workers when you are going to try to consider control measures because you want to implement some designs, you know, maybe you are installing some physical controls. You want to make sure that the design is not going to disrupt the workflow too much, or you may end up having workers bypassing that control. You know, you want to make sure it fits in with how they do their work as, as much as possible. 
Um, but you know, you're going to implement the controls. And at some point, you do want to assess the controls and make sure that they're effective. And as I said, we'll get into this a little more in depth a few slides in. Now, an individual who takes on the role and employs the concept of industrial hygiene can call themselves an industrial hygienist. Um, again, the industrial hygienist is going to be that person that's going to be out there evaluating and looking at options to control any potential exposures that could be harmful to workers. You know, through their education, training, and experience, you know, they hopefully will be able to um, take a look at potential health hazards and make some determinations on, you know, what needs to be done. You know, there, there isn't any legal stipulation as to who, who can and who can't call themselves an industrial hygienist. Um, anyone could call themselves an industrial hygienist, I guess. But, you know, as a result, there is uh, an association that was developed, this American Board of Industrial Hygiene. You know, their sole purpose was to establish, you know, a credentialing program, you know, to establish some minimum qualifications for an industrial hygienist to be considered a you know, professional industrial hygienist. So there are some you know, groups out there that provide some minimum standards of education. And there are a lot of other professional associations as well that you know, promote the practice and promote the understanding of industrial hygiene. And since, since then, since the, the birth of industrial hygiene, uh, the scope is actually, it's expanded quite a bit. It's gone from just what we have within our walls, if you will, in our, in our companies, to what's outside. Uh, we, we're looking at the environment now. We're looking at things like the hazardous chemicals potentially getting out into the, uh, into the water, for example, or into the air. And the, the titles have expanded as well. Um, it's not just industrial hygienists anymore. We have environmental slash public health engineers, for example, environmental health and safety manager, where we have kind of both of those uh, combined into, uh, into one, uh, one, one set of responsibilities. Uh, also environmental health technicians, specialists and managers. It's, it's really grown over the past uh, you know, several, mm -hmm. uh, quite a few years now. Yeah, and these, you know, these folks that, you know, have that added specialty, again, they're going to be really out there looking to find ways to minimize any, any chemical or other pollutant contamination that gets into the environment that could impact, you know, not only the environment, but human health as well. So some of the things that industrial hygienists will do, uh, I Obviously, number one is to take a look at, assess, and to identify and you know determine hazardous chemicals, hazardous wastes in the workplace. To take a look at what are the levels, are, have, are those levels exceeding any any uh, any any boundaries that are out there in the standards? Uh, not only just hazardous chemicals, though, but also think about harmful physical um, agents such as. Oh, heat, excessive heat, for example. Uh, we may have radiation, we may have um, biological things, uh, biological agents that can get in into our systems. All of those things come under the purview of industrial hygiene. Additionally, ergonomics is something that comes under the, the area of industrial hygiene as well. So if we look at well, okay, we're, we're going to look at maybe office ergonomics, for example, or industrial ergonomics. That's another, another big area within the area of industrial hygiene. But then getting outside, outside of the, our, our walls, if you will, we're looking at monitoring and managing pollutant emissions. And we'll get into that a little bit later in the presentation. But uh, some of the things that need to be done too, in terms of Air and water, the permits. What's what are what are the limits? How much can we how much can we put out? How do we how do we measure all those things? And finally, just emergency management, being prepared for an emergency, uh, hazardous waste operations, for example, Haswoper, uh, being prepared, having those people trained and ready to go if if there is an issue. So what I wanted to get into now was just you know, kind of, you know, talk about a process for how you would assess hazards and assess potential harmful exposures in the workplace. As I said earlier, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a good idea to really kind of have some kind of a thought through strategy on how you want to assess a work environment. 
you know, don't just take random air samples here and there and not really know what to do with those results, but really take a look at the work, really understand what's going on. You know, in a sense, that's would be the characterization part of the process. Really understand what's going on, what's being done. Again, how is the work being performed? What other tools and equipment are involved? You know, how close are workers to the hazard source? You know, how many are affected? All that can be considered, but really get an understanding of the work that's being done. And then start to anticipate and recognize those potential hazards. You know, what, what, what is being emitted or what other agents are potentially impacting worker health. Um, I think it's a good idea to establish similar exposure groups. And what I mean by that is, you know, there may be workers that perform similar tasks. Maybe they're in a, in a kind of the same general area. Maybe not, but they perform similar tasks, you know, use similar methods or they work with similar raw materials. I mean, it's good to establish these kind of groups because it helps you to ensure that you're, you know, doing a rep representative sample of, of that group and ensuring that you're assessing, you know, all that may be part of that group. And then you, you certainly want to kind of take a look, okay, just, you know, what is the magnitude or intensity of, this, of these exposures? Is it something that would be considered acceptable or not? You know, what are the main routes of exposure that we need to be concerned with? You know, most of the time inhalation is going to be the primary, but it could be, could be ingestion, it could be absorption through the skin or even through the eyes, even injection. You know, you think about healthcare workers and, and bloodborne pathogens. I mean, needle sticks are a common thing. So injection could be something to consider. And again, just, you know, how many are exposed and really the duration and how often they're exposed during a work shift. You know, all that needs to be considered because really, you know, you can't fix everything at once. You know, you're going to have to prioritize things and you want to prioritize those areas where exposures would seem to be more unacceptable or that, um, you know, maybe the potential contaminants of concern have really low exposure limits. You know, you're gonna to wanna to prioritize those types of areas first. Um, certainly look at existing occupational exposure limits that are out there along with any other kind of health-related data, toxicological data, safety data sheets will have information. You know, get a good understanding of everything as much as you can because you know, you're gonna need that information to know, you know where to go next as far as your assessment and, and evaluation. Because as I alluded to earlier, you know, not everything is going to be readily recognizable as a serious hazard. So, you know, once you've done all your groundwork, once you've identified, you know, what you think may be potential hazards and workplace exposures that should be assessed further, then you can start to think about, okay, what areas or what workers should we uh, evaluate further? Um, you know, again, air sampling is going to be a common thing when we when we work with clients. You know, we certainly do a lot of air sampling for them just to help them, you know, better understand their exposures. A lot of times it's just to know they haven't done any sampling before and they just, you know, you should probably know what our workers are truly exposed to. And even if you don't pick up a lot, at least you have something to show that, hey, we've, we've done some due diligence. We know what potential exposures there are, even if they're minimal, it doesn't matter. You don't want to have someone coming back 20 years later accusing you of, of uh, you know causing some illness that they have you know this is just your record your way of saying that well no you know we've got some record of what of uh, uh, what 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 exposures were in the workplace and you know it's just a good thing to have on hand and maybe you have a situation where you have a lot of different uh, levels of exposure you got to have some good data available to you know show that you're doing your due, due, due diligence I should say. And, and then from that information, you'll start to determine, well, what kind of control measures can we implement and use? You know, if you're doing air sampling or other monitoring, um, when you start to exceed permissible exposure limits, you're gonna have to come up with some kind of controls. And so this is where it's important to, again, pinpoint where to focus your attention first, as I alluded to earlier, get workers involved in discussing what controls would be appropriate or how it should be designed. Uh, because again, you don't want to implement something that 
has the potential to be bypassed because it's too disruptive to how the workers are used to performing their work. Um, and follow up on the infected on the effectiveness is really important. Um, you got to have some idea as to whether this you know control that you implemented is actually working. So maybe after a few weeks or even a few months, you know, go back and, and take a look, you know, talk to workers, get some verbal visual cues as to whether you think the control measures are actually effective. And lastly, you definitely want to communicate any findings to the workforce, um, to anyone that's, you know, to any of those affected workers. Um, if you've done exposure monitoring of any type, you know, share the results. If you know you're going to be implementing some control measures, let them know because hopefully it'll it'll help them to better accept, you know, those control measures and not try to bypass things because they understand that well this is being implemented for a reason. You know, I've I've got some excessive exposure and so they're gonna we're gonna take steps to try to minimize that. So important to keep the communication lines open. Well, next, we'd like to show you some of the, uh, the tools of the trade, if you will, the, uh, the, the things that we have in our toolbox uh, from an industrial hygiene perspective that we can use to help characterize, to help identify and to understand what, uh, what we're dealing with. Uh, the one up on the upper, upper left is actually, it's a, it, it helps us to understand the level of heat stress. And we can use that to identify, it, it takes into account humidity, relative temperature, and it gives us a good understanding of what, uh, what, what, we're, what we're up against, what we're dealing with. Uh, the one in the upper uh, middle is an air pump, and that has a cyclone attached to it. And essentially, we would use that to uh, measure for respirable dusts. Over on the, the far right upper, upper hand, upper corner, is uh, that's a noise dosimeter. And that is something that we would, it would actually ride along on a person. It kind of clips up in, in this area right here. And it experiences the, the level of noise that that person who's carrying it around for that work shift. So we can say, well, yeah, it's noisy out there, but how noisy is it? This will give us the actual data. And then we can compare that against the standard and say, well, are we above or below the threshold where we need to implement a hearing conservation program? Uh, it's very similar down in the lower right hand corner is a, a, basically it's a noise monitor. It's a sound level meter. Uh, it's a direct read and that'll give us an idea of how, how close are we. But the, the, the noise dosimeter will give us the eight hour time weighted yeah, average. The good thing with the dosimeter is it, yeah, in a sense, it's giving you a good, it's giving you an average. The sound level meter is more of a spot check kind of thing. I mean, I guess if you take a, enough readings, you know, you can get a good understanding. If the noise levels don't fluctuate too much, you can get a good understanding of the potential noise exposures by using a sound level meter. But otherwise, that's more of a pre preliminary, you know, survey tool. And then using it and getting the readings, you can decide, oh, well, there's a couple of workers here that probably want to do some further monitoring on. And then that's where a noise decimeter comes in handy. Exactly. Uh, next, uh, uh, over to the left from the uh, from the noise monitor, we have the uh, volometer, and essentially what that lets us do that lets us identify what is the actual um, feet per minute uh, of flow uh, going into a, a spray finishing booth, for example. So we can get an idea of what is the capture velocity, uh, whatever it is that we're trying to capture and and, and get out of the the building. That'll help us with that. In the middle, uh, lower middle, we have two air pumps. And essentially what those will let us do is those are going to draw air, uh, a certain metered amount of air over whatever the, the filter or whatever the media is that we have. We have the little round cassettes. We may have uh, tubes. And, and again, that depends on what it is that we're looking for. And when we're all done, we'll send that back to the lab and the lab will analyze and they'll say, okay, for Toluene, for example, if that's what we're looking for, it'll tell us how many parts per million we had over that eight, eight hour time weighted average. Also over on the other side, on the very lower left, that's another example of an air pump. Yeah, and there's a lot of other direct reading instruments. You know, Obviously there's things for confined space entry and whatnot. Again, typically when we help clients, a lot of what we do is air sampling and noise monitoring, but we'll, we'll certainly do whatever needs to be done. But as Mike alluded, all kinds of different media that you can use to sample with, you know, for air sampling. So 
yeah, the more we can learn up front what we may be sampling for, the better. You know, a lot of times people will call us and, oh, yeah, we need an earth sample. And, you know, they don't really have a good idea of what they're sampling for. They just, hey, can you do just kind of a general, you know, sample? And it, it helps the lab as well to know what we're keying in on because they don't necessarily, you know, it may be hard for them to really know what they're supposed to be sampling for or analyzing for, I should say. So, um, but yeah, a lot of different media, a lot of different instruments that can be used. Okay. And next, we're going to talk a little bit about the hierarchy of, of hazards and controls, the ha hierarchy of controls. Essentially, when we look at this, up at the very top, where we always like to start out is elimination. If we can eliminate a hazard, that's always going to be the best, but that's not always possible either. So as we move down towards the bottom, uh, we start looking at substitution. Can we substitute maybe a less hazardous chemical, for example, uh, something that will still get the job done, but it's easier on us, it's easier on the environment as well. If we can't do that, we start looking at engineering controls. How can we isolate us, the people, from the hazard itself? But as you see on the, on the left margin, as we're walk, going down this, uh, this upside down triangle here, we are, the, the controls are becoming less effective. Uh, and we'll see down at the very bottom, we have personal protective equipment where if none of the others will work, uh, we have to default to personal protective equipment. And I think what Dave and I, see occasionally is that sometimes personal protective equipment is the first choice mm -hmm. and we're much better off going going up a few steps and say well is there any way to possibly engineer this out so we don't even need personal protective equipment yeah i mean and i should note i mean a key part of using personal protective equipment i mean it's only as good as the user and how they use it i mean you've got to make sure you're using what's appropriate for the hazard it's got to be worn properly. I mean, in the case of a respirator, you know, it's got to be fit tested. You got to be able to, it's got to be fitted so that it's fully protecting you and it's got to be appropriate. The filters have to be appropriate for what you're uh, trying to protect yourself against. So, um, you know, if you're not following through and taking all those added steps to ensure you're using it properly and, it, and appropriately, you really diminish the protective level that you're going to get. Um, same with like hearing protection and foam plugs. You know, how often does someone really take the time to roll up that foam plug into small diameter, insert it fully into the ear canal and then hold it in place afterwards and let it expand fully? You know, instead they just kind of push it in superficially and then go to work. And really, you're really diminishing the protective impact of that ear plug. So much better to look at ways to engineer the noise out you know, with sound dampening or, or enclosing the noise source or enclosing the worker from the noise source or with respect to respirators, much better to try to look at ways to exhaust the hazard out before it can get breathed in by the worker versus relying on a respirator. Now, wanted to get back to some of the OSHA standards. Um, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of standards that, you know, well, one of them, the Z tables or, you know, subpart Z has the Z tables uh, that are commonly referred to. They list out a lot of various permissible exposure limits for all these different chemicals that are out there. And it certainly isn't all inclusive. I mean, there's chemicals being made all the time, but it, it regulates certain chemicals that are listed. And again, most are based on a eight hour time weighted average permissible exposure limit. You know, some chemicals will have short-term exposure limits or STELs, which are based on a 15-minute average, and then others even have a ceiling limit, which is a not to exceed at any point. And these latter two are assigned to chemicals that have more of an acute hazard, you know, more immediate health impacts. Um, but again, most of the time, it's all based on an eight-hour time-weighted average. So when we're monitoring, we always recommend if we're going to sample, we want to try to sample as much of a work shift. Like let's say it's an eight-hour work shift. We want to sample as much of that work shift as we can to allow us to compare with these uh, limits because that's what they're based on. Um, there are also substance-specific standards out there, and we're going to talk about that a little more in depth shortly. But um, 
And then outside of subpart Z, we have the noise standard. And in Minnesota, there's actually a heat stress standard. And Mike mentioned the heat stress meter. Um, you know, the heat stress standard is based on a two hour average and it considers, you know, when you measure it, you're gonna, again, you're gonna consider the, not only the temperature, but the humidity, air movement and any other radiant heat source. And in addition, you'll consider the work activity, whether it's light, moderate or heavy work activity. And on the environmental side, I mean, there's a number of different laws and regulations that come into play to, you know, really, you know, take measures to minimize any pollutant emissions and to really focus on, you know, protecting the health of the environment and those outside in the environment. I mean, it's really protecting people and the environment. That's, you know, EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency, that's, that's the role in that organization. You know, they're promoting programs, policies, methods to minimize pollutants and to minimize any potential harm that can result from that. Um, in Minnesota, we have the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, which is a state program that administers their own rules in addition to some of the federal rules. And other states have their own state programs as well. But um, again, the whole goal is we're trying to promote programs, promote policies or promoting emission limits that will, again, hopefully protect the environment and the people within from any unnecessary you know, health hazards. Now we're, we're gonna move the discussion back a little bit again to the, the health standards, uh, the subpart Z, this is in um, section 1000, 1910.1000, and we refer to it as the Z tables. <clears throat> Within here, there are some specific high hazard chemicals that have specific standards for them. Uh, benzene is a good example of that. Um, as far as those standards go, they will have, it's going to follow the same general idea as, as Dave explained earlier, but we need to do some air sampling in most cases to find out what levels are we at right now. and is there anything that we need to be doing to, to reduce those if we've, if we've exceeded any levels? So we're taking a look at that objective data, the air sampling would be a good example of that. If there's any other industry specific data that we can get our hands on, we'll do that as well. But in many cases, these standards will also require, especially if, you have, uh, if you're in a situation where we've exceeded a permissible exposure limit for that particular substance, we'll have to do some additional routine monitoring. And those standards will spell out exactly, do we have to do, uh, and we have to come back again, maybe in a, you know, three month intervals or whatever it might be to help ensure that we're, we're driving by what we're doing, the, the controls that we're putting in place, we're driving it down, and we're getting down below that, uh, that permissible exposure level. Yeah, most of these standards are kind of written under the same format of yes, do that initial assessment, and then they have this routine monitoring in there. And really, it, in my mind, it's, it's kind of this way to try to push work sites to yeah, implement some other control measures so that you don't have to always do this ongoing monitoring because you know, who, who wants to do that in the first place? Yes, you want to find out what the exposures are. And then hopefully, you can take measures to them, you know, reduce them adequately. But otherwise, yeah, as Mike alluded, I mean, if you're identifying exposures beyond a permissible exposure limit, um, the standards will establish a monitoring schedule. You know, for example, a hex chrome, you know, above a PEL means you have to can do some periodic monitoring within three months until two consecutive, two consecutive samples beyond a seven day period show that, you know, your levels are below that permissible limit. But even for what's considered an action level, which is really, usually it's half the, exposure limit, but sometimes not, but it's just a level that, you know, we feel requires some additional surveillance and a lot of chemicals have a stated action level. Um, even at that level, it'll still require doing ongoing monitoring, but maybe at a more extended uh, time interval, like six months. Again, same thing. You do that continuous monitoring until you get two consecutive results that show that you're below the action level. But Again, most of these standards are kind of written the same. And you know, once you've done that initial monitoring, 
um, and you know determine where you're at. You know, if you're going to be above that permissible exposure limit, the standards really want to push the use of engineering controls to try to minimize that exposure. I mean, work practice controls can be considered, but really, you know, engineering controls are going to be the main focus um, from an OSHA standpoint. You know. If an employer has to comply with one of these standards, um, they're going to be looking to see if any attempts were made to implement, you know, feasible controls. Obviously, not you can't always, you know, use controls to bring an exposure down adequately. But uh, a lot of citations can have been issued because no attempt was made to try to engineer the hazard out first and foremost. The reliance went to PPE right away, and, and you don't want that to be your first and last option. Obviously, if you don't control something well enough or can't feasibly control it well enough, then yeah, respiratory protection and other PPE would be considered. But that's only at that point is when you should consider it. Back to our triangle. Yeah, our yeah exactly. Hierarchy. And, and these health standards often will have some kind of provisions for housekeeping. You know, if it's something that some type of a chemical that could collect on a surface, um, you want to, you know, keep that surface as clean as practical is, is the terminology. Um, you just wanna take whatever measures you can to minimize that buildup as much as possible. And you wanna take steps to clean it without causing it to be reintroduced back into the air. So yeah, dry sweeping or you know, blowing things off with compressed air are not gonna be the methods you wanna use. Uh, using a HEPA vac or other wet methods, I mean, those would be more suitable because again, you're not, you know, you've got something settled out. Well, you don't want to kick it back into the air and create a, a potential exposure issue that way. And then there's going to be standards that have specific requirements for, you know, hygiene areas and practices. You know, a good example is lead or asbestos. I mean, you're going to have to establish specific change areas, you know, like areas for showering and other washing, you know, just to ensure that that contaminant stays in the workplace versus tracking at home with you. And a good example, again, would be lead. You know, we've had households that have been contaminated because unknowingly the worker brings the lead home through their clothing and even from their skin, and then it contaminates the house. So these hygiene facilities and practices that are done at work are intended to ensure that you're not tracking any contaminant back home with you from outside the workplace. And medical surveillance, you know, again, and this is based on, you know, how often or how many days a year someone can be exposed above the permissible exposure limit. But again, if someone could be exposed or you anticipate that an employee could be exposed for more than 30 days in a 12 month period, you're gonna have to establish some kind of medical surveillance program. And each individual health standard will have their own provisions, but for the most part, you know, you're gonna be doing some kind of medical monitoring, could be a chest x-ray, um, could be biological analysis, you know, blood analysis or urinalysis, it could be, um, you know, doing a pulmonary function test or any other physical exam, whatever, whatever the healthcare professional deems appropriate. Um, part of this medical surveillance requirement will require that the employer provide information to the healthcare professional. Um, that can include a copy of the relevant OSHA standard. Um, it could be information on what the worker was doing, what tasks they were performing, if there's any past exposure monitoring data, what that, what those results were. Um, could be any other past medical, past medical surveillance that was done that's related. Um, you know, anything that's going to help that healthcare professional formulate a good opinion, you know, based on their findings. And then they have to provide that opinion back to the employer within 30 days of the exam. And basically it's gonna just say if, if any type of you know, medical condition was identified, they're gonna provide an opinion as to whether that worker will increase their risk of health effects if they go back to work. They may have to prescribe you know, medical removal or limitations on the length of time they can work. They may even have restrictions on respirator use. Um, again, anything that would help to better ensure the health of the worker, you know, will provide that opinion to the employer. Then when we have our results uh, for these 
specific, these ha hazardous uh, substance specific standards. Here we have beryllium. Uh, there's a situation where, okay, if we have exceeded a permissible exposure level and we have to put controls in place, we have to number one, train the employees on what those new, those new protocols are going to be. Uh, as Dave alluded, we need to let them know what the, uh, what, what the results were of the monitoring, but also communicating those hazards and letting people know uh, by, by placarding, number one, uh, if we have an area that, that has beryllium in it or asbestos or, or whatever the case, we need to provide some kind of a notification that only authorized person people are allowed in there. Uh, there's record keeping requirements as well with these. Uh, we need to hang on to those medical surveillance records, for example. The exposure monitoring records, as David alluded to, it's Good to have those if anybody asks down the road. Uh, the training records uh, is a good good practice. It's always good a good idea to keep any safety training related records for at least three years. But in the case of these these specific hazard hazardous chemical hazardous substance specific standards, in some cases they're going to require that we hang on to those records for forty years or. 20 years beyond uh, the, the, the worker uh, having left the company. And additionally, if the company uh, maybe is sold, those records need to be transferred to the new owner. So this, each standard will have its, uh, its own specific requirements. And employees do have access to these records, training, medical exposure monitoring, you know, upon request or their designated rep and, you know, employers would be expected to provide that to them. And then additionally, in, in the back to the Z tables in 1910.1000, uh, the exposure limits will be in there. Um, again, an exposure assessment needs to be done. Uh, but there, there are other standards. If, if it's not in the Z tables, and OSHA may refer to these in a citation, uh, although they can't necessarily enforce them, they can certainly refer to it to help build their case. Uh, for example, and an REL, a, a TLV, a threshold limit value, for example, the ACGIH, or even the, uh, the workplace environmental exposure levels, any of those kind of things, uh, recommend exposure level on the top, any of those can be, can be mentioned. Yeah, I mean, again, as Mike said, they're not directly enforceable, but they can be a reference or something that could be used, you know, any reference standards for that matter, they can be used to support a, a citation if there isn't a direct OSHA rule you know, in place to regulate whatever hazard might have been identified by the investigator. Um, and just briefly, I wanted to touch, you know, again, the noise standard, it isn't part of this, the subpart Z in the OSHA rules, but still written up very similar. You've got to do initial monitoring. If you suspect any worker that might be exposed to noise you know, that's approaching that 85 or exceeding that 85 decibel range, you know, you got to do monitoring to make sure you know what their exposures are. And then if they are above that level, you'll, you'll have to implement a hearing conservation program. And then depending on how high beyond that, you know, may have to require the use of hearing protection. And then the program's going to, you know, have the annual audiogram requirements and the training and whatnot. But again, more or less, all these standards are all you know, written to require that initial assessment, that initial determination, so that you know what you're working with. I can, Dave, we have a question. Yes. Uh, just for clarification, do all the IH related issues fall under OSHA regulations? Not, well, not necessarily. I mean, we're gonna cover some of the environmental requirements as well, but yeah, there are a lot of health related standards that get regulated by OSHA. and. That subpart Z has, you know, lists out most of them. There are a few others that are more health related that are outside of, including the noise standard. Um, but you know, even the hazard communication, that's part of that same subpart Z, where it requires you to train workers on the hazards of the materials that they work with. So yeah. But you know, we'll we'll get it, we're gonna, we're gonna just start getting into some of the environmental regulations as well, which you know certainly relates to to health as well, but it also encompasses environmental health. Okay, so yeah, let's let's turn to the environmental side. I mean, there are a lot of requirements that are gonna to need to be followed 
you know, as a business, you're likely going to, you know, emit some type of pollutant, generate some type of waste. And, you know, if it's hazardous to the environment, you're likely going to have to monitor it, probably have some kind of a permit. And, you know, we'll discuss some of these requirements going forward here. Um, you know, for air emissions, you know, if, if you have the potential to emit, and that's just based on the, the you know, materials you use, um, you can base it on the purchases or actual usage, but if you have the potential to emit pollutants beyond, you know, threshold limits regulated by fe the federal EPA, you're going to have to have a permit. Um, if you're able to show that you can be well within those limits, you know, not more than half, then you don't have to have a federal permit. Maybe a state permit would be appropriate then, but you, you'll have to have some kind of a permit to follow. You know, most of the clients we work with, they have pretty simplified, you know, they call them registration permits. You know, and we typically have worked with clients that have option D permits, a few with option B. These are pretty simplified one page permits. You know, there is this part 70 federal permit that, you know, is really, it's, it's geared more for the big polluters, you know, the big companies that can generate a lot of pollutants. These permits are going to require a lot more, you know, they're going to require pollution control measures and whatnot to ensure that emissions can exceed those federal limits. And within the state here too, we have these capped emission permits that, you know, maybe the site generates or has the potential to emit more than what's allowed in a registration permit, but, you know, they, it's a pretty, you know, simplified, non-complex process. And it's just, it's a site-specific permit and it's just going to, require, you know, restricting emissions to within, you know, like 75 to 90 percent of the federal limits. Um, but again, I think the key thing to keep in mind is, you know, follow what the permit says. Um, you know, if you know you could potentially emit high levels, um, you get a permit, you apply for a permit, and then follow it. You know, there may be some requirements. Most of them are going to have some ongoing emissions tracking that you have to do. There's going to be annual reporting that you do online. Um, there might be, you know, other reports you have to do, for example, things that we work with our clients with, you know, there could be deviation reports where, you know, maybe something happened or maybe whatever pollution control was in place, maybe something happened or required maintenance and it allowed for some excessive emissions to occur. You know, you'll have to complete a report that summarizes what happened and what was done to correct it. Or there could be other, you know, these annual compliance certification reports that just more or less confirm that nothing happened or everything was still operating okay and that you don't feel that you violated anything in the permit. You know, some industrial processes fall under this NESHAP reporting and the requirements. You know, NESHAP is just the national emission standards for hazardous air pollutants. Again, certain industries might fall under, under those requirements. And those requirements um, are in addition to whatever air permit you have. So, you know, NESHAP will focus in on some key hazardous air pollutants and the work processes that can generate that. A uh, simple example is halogenated solvents used for cleaning, you know, degreasing operations. Um, there's going to be a NESHAP regulation that will oversee and, and require certain equipment and machine designs as well as work practices to ensure that you can't exceed any emission limits. You know, this slide, it just gives some examples of emission limits. And again, you know, if you don't anticipate exceeding a federal limit, but you exceed state limits, or if you have to take measures like pollution controls or limiting production times to stay within federal limits, you know, then you'll still have to have a state permit. But you may, as I said, you may be able to apply for just a simple one page option D permit. Now, if you have the potential to release pollutants through stormwater, you know, there's a uh, requirements in a program that you would have to follow this National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System program. It will require you to, um, you know, monitor pollutants and ensure that you're not performing any activities or leaving any materials outside that could be susceptible to stormwater and snowmelt runoff. Again, you're just, it's a program to try to ensure that you're minimizing any pollutant discharge to the extent possible. Um, and in, in Minnesota, it, we have this state disposal system program, which is regulated under this Minnesota statute 115. And it's just some added precautions to protect against groundwater. But if you do get a stormwater permit, 
um, you know, the permit's going to say NPDES slash SDS, you know, more or less it's encompassing both programs. But again, you know, the program's in place and you're applying for that permit to regulate how you manage any activities on site and how you store activity or store materials to minimize any pollutants. You know, most of the clients- another, Sorry to interrupt, sorry. Uh, we have another question. Um, with the, uh, Tim Tim is asking if you can review the storm water again. How often do we have to test for this in Minnesota? I'll, I'll get into that right now, yep. Okay. Yeah, yeah, most of the most most of the clients we work with will be able to apply for general permits and uh, part of that permitting application process is, you know, you have to develop a stormwater pollution prevention plan or SWIP is what we call it, SWPPP. You know, this plan will lay out, you know, where your pollutant sources are, what you're going to do to try to minimize the pollutants. You know, we use the term best management practices or BMPs. These are methods that can be employed to, you know, minimize discharge of those pollutants into the environment. And that would be stated as part of this SWIP plan. It'll identify your inspect routine inspections and maintenance that you're going to perform. And, you know, to get back to the question, it'll spell out what you have to do to monitor your pollutant discharges. You know, you're going to have to act as an employer, you're going to have to actually take water samples of your stormwater and snowmelt runoff, you know, throughout the year. Your permit's gonna say to take four samples, you're gonna take a sample every quarter, at least in Minnesota, the requirement is you take a sample every quarter for a year, you get those four samples, and then the average should be within uh, an established benchmark. You know, if you, if you stay within that benchmark for that average of those four samples, then you don't have to do any further monitoring. If you aren't within the benchmark, then you're going to have to take some steps to try to minimize the pollutant discharge, and then you're going to have to keep monitoring until you can show that you can stay within that benchmark. You know the average results are within. Some specific industries have effluent limits, and these are not to exceed limits. Exceeding this limit is actually an, a violation of the permit, and these are just done once a year. You sample once a year, and there's a location established where you take that effluent, effluent sample, same as with benchmark. And again, you know, it's going to be stated in your permit if you have to. Most of the time, the general permits, unless it's a specific industry, will just have benchmark monitoring. They'll have locations identified, and then you'll, you'll do your monitoring. And then part of your annual reporting is going to include, you know, entering and entering all your monitoring data, you're going to enter a summary of any of the inspections that you did and the findings and what was done. Um, all that's going to be part of the permitting requirements. And then annual training will be part of it as well. Uh, anyone that's involved in any activities that could generate pollutants into the stormwater, um, anyone that's involved in the routine inspections or in the maintenance of any BMPs, any of those folks will have to have training. And part of that training will just be to cover the goals of the program and what you're trying to accomplish and how you're going to do it. Now, this slide talks about the no exposure exclusion. And if you don't have any outdoor activities, any activities outdoors that could contribute to stormwater pollution, you could apply for a no exposure, no exposure exclusion. So that just basically means that any rain, snow, runoff, would not be able to contact significant materials and you know run off into the environment. So essentially what we have up in the upper left hand corner, we have a roof over what we have stored out so outdoors. Uh, in the, on, on the upper right, we have some dumpsters that have covers over them. So rainwater cannot get in. That's the key thing. Seep through. Have a cover. That's yeah, that is it's fairly fairly simple, but uh, it, it makes a difference. Uh, we have the the barrels on the lower right, and uh, those are indoors, and they also have some drip pans underneath them. And even in the case of a, a, a holding pond, it can be considered, but there can't be any chance that it could overflow. And additionally, with no exposure, if if we have that exclusion, they occasionally find no exposure violations. And some examples of those violations could be well, where we said, no, we don't have any activities outdoors, but actually there are some. Um, 
potentially welding or cutting, for example. Um, activity, activities that generate dust or particulates, even uh, outdoor bag houses, for example, is a, is a, good, a good case of that. Uh, vehicle or equipment washing, um, fueling of vehicles, mm -hmm. things like that. All, the, all these things are potential violations mm -hmm. of a no exposure. The key thing with this, I mean, even if you apply and get a no, no exposure exclusion for stormwater, I mean, you still have to, you know, ensure that you're not introducing activities or and that you're not just, you know, dumping stuff outside, um, you know, that could contribute to stormwater pollution. Um, still have to make sure, you know, dumpsters, again, the simple make sure they're covered. You still have to make sure that you're doing all this stuff. And in the case of like dust collectors, you know, that's been listed as something that can be a violation. You know, if there's visible particulate, you know, that's generated from that, which is common, yeah, it's gonna, that's gonna violate that exposure exclusion. So you may have to put some kind of a shelter or cover or canopy over it so that you can separate it from any uh, rain runoff or snow melt runoff. Now, you know, there are, regulations in place too to protect the waters from any oil spills. And that's where this spill prevention countermeasure and control program comes into play. Uh, if you're an employment site, if you're an establishment that you know stores, processes, you know, refines or uses, consumes oil in amounts that exceed this 1,320 gallons above ground, and that can include you know smaller containers you know, containers have to be at least 55 gallons or more to count towards this. But, um, you know, if you reach or exceed that total, or if you have underground storage of oil that is at 42,000 gallons or more, you're going to have to comply by the requirements of this program. Um, you know, the program is going to require that you designate someone to implement it. And really, it's going to just outline what measures you're going to take to not only prevent a spill, but to counteract and to contain a spill when it occurs. Um, the program should be reviewed, you know, at least, you know, year to year, because you wanna make sure it's reflective of the conditions and remains reflective of the conditions at the work site, even, even including updating any emergency contacts, things like that. And then every five years, most of them, you're gonna require, you're gonna be required to have a professional engineer come in and do a thorough review and certify that the plan is, you know, reflective of the conditions and appears to be effective. Training is another component of the program. You know, anyone involved with any processes involving oil or anyone that might be involved in doing any kind of, you know, spill response, anything like that, involved in doing routine maintenance and inspection that could, you know, be involved with any, any processes involve oil, you know, all those folks are going to be required to go through some training. Um, you know, again, this SPCC program is going to highlight what you're going to do to prevent an oil spill, um, as well as contain a spill. You know, prevention could be just, you know, having alarms and gauges that, you know, prevent overfilling something or anything like that. Spill countermeasures could also include, you know, spill kits, you know, having other secondary containment that something could drain into, um, you know, other prevention measures could include, you know, dikes, berms, walls, anything that can contain the spill so it can't get outside the establishment and into the environment, you know, all that's going to be outlined as part of your program. I mean, you, you're supposed to have a floor plan as part of this that outlines where everything is, what controls are in place, what alarm systems you have all that. And then again, inspection and maintenance is a key part. You know, make sure those alarm systems are functioning. You know, make sure every, all your containment structures are intact. Um, you know, inspect piping and fittings and valves and supports, make sure everything's intact. You know, we don't want to have any chance of anything leaking out. And for those that are involved in bulk oil transfers and pickup, you know, they'll have to have some added training just to know how to properly hook up maybe just inform them to have, you know, secondary containment on hand to collect any drips that might come out. Might even have site security measures you need to have in place. Um, and that can include, you know, physical, you know, fencing, security cameras, uh, lighting, anything like that to help ensure security of the work site. Now, from an emergency planning standpoint, um, 
there are there is a requirement to you know take that planning to the community level, not just within the facility. This uh, Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, which is part of this SARA or Superfund Amendment, you know, it's going to require establishments to identify and inventory what chemicals they have on site that would require a safety data sheet under HAZCOM. Um, you know, inventory what you have, and then a lot of facilities annually are going to have to report, you know, they call it this tier two report. They're going to have to report chemicals that had in quantities, you know, beyond this 10,000 pounds is, is a threshold. If you have chemicals that require an SDS and you have in quantities beyond 10,000 pounds, you're gonna to have to report that annually. In addition, there's chemicals that are listed as extremely hazardous substances. Those have much lower thresholds limits, you know, 500 pounds or even less. You're gonna to have to report those as well. And if you do have EHS chemicals on site, that are above the threshold, you're also gonna to have to have some kind of emergency planning as part of the requirement. But this is all just to help ensure that at a community level, you're providing some information to the emergency response personnel and to the state as to what you may have on site so that you know uh, emergency personnel can be better prepared. Now, hazardous waste, I mean, just about any process can generate waste and this Resource Conservation and Recovery Act is just focused on what would be considered hazardous. And so if you generate hazardous waste, there's gonna be a lot of steps you have to take to track how much you generate, you know, manage the storage and transport and disposal, you know, planning for emergency incidents, um, submitting an annual, what we call an annual management plan, which basically just summarizes how much hazardous waste you generated. You know, if you're located in one of the seven metro counties of St. Paul, Minneapolis area, you'll be submitting your plan to the county. You know, the county is going to be the jurisdiction for has waste there. If you're outside, then you'll just submit that to the state. Um, submissions for the counties are typically January 31st of the following year, except for Hennepin County, which would be December 15th. Otherwise, if you're outside that area, it would be by August 1st, you have to submit that plan. Um, now, as far as what would be considered hazardous waste, and I'll kind of run through this quick, but there's, there's certain chemicals that are listed that would be considered hazardous and that would fall under that hazardous waste categorization. You know, the F list lists out, you know, non-specific sources, not they're not related to any specific industry or process, you know, just about any kind of industry could potentially generate it. Those would be F list hazardous waste. The K list would be more specific to a certain industry or process. And then the P list would be those that would be considered acutely toxic waste. And then the U list would be just like discarded chemicals. It could even be chemical that was released because of a spill. Um, those would be the waste that would be um, considered listed waste that you would that would put something into the category of hazardous. There are also characteristics that might make something be considered hazardous. If something's ignitable, like if it's a liquid, it would have a flash point of less than 140 degrees Fahrenheit, or it could be a solid that could ignite or that could react with air or through friction that could ignite. Um, if you could have, it could be uh, an oxidizer, you know, something that promotes combustion or that, or that really causes the reaction to occur more readily and more and um, with greater magnitude. A corrosive, if you have a, something with a pH of two or less or 12 and a half or greater, you're going to fall under that category and you have to consider it a hazardous waste. Or if it's reactive, meaning that it could react with air or it could even detonate, you know, that, that could put the waste under that category where it would have to be considered hazardous. You know, toxicity is another characteristic. And this is more focused on, you know, what kind of impact the chemical could have and how easily it could leach into the environment. And there's a list of 40 chemicals that have specific limits on how much could be in that waste before it would have to be considered a toxic waste. Um, and then lethality, that's, that's a Minnesota-specific characteristic, but that's, that's based more on this LD50 or lethal dose 50, which is what is used when you're doing you know, tests in a lab. And if, if half the test population 
dies or is killed at whatever level, that's going to be the LD50, and, and that's used to uh, determine lethality. And I guess I can give an example, like if it's a dust or a particulate or a mist, if the LD50 is 2,000 milligrams per meter cubed or less for that substance, then it would fall under the lethality characteristic. Now, universal waste, you know, a lot of sites can generate these kind of waste. Universal waste don't count towards your generator size. I mean, everyone generates a certain amount of waste and you're put into a certain size category based on how much you generate. Universal waste are a separate thing. You know, you, metro counties might still require you to report this stuff, but these are materials that, you know, just about anybody can generate. Um, it doesn't count towards your generator size, but it is still something that we, you would have to manage appropriately and dispose appropriately. As far as hazardous waste containers, we just need to make sure that we're labeling them properly, that they're plainly labeled as hazardous waste, like, like we see here. Uh, the accumulation start date and the contents of what's actually inside of that, uh, of that barrel or drum or whatever it is. And... Uh, also, there is an exempt exemption for satellite containers. So essentially, that is something that is located near the source. We can accumulate in there, and then we do not have to get the accumulation start date put on there until it is filled up and we move it to the waste storage. Yeah, area. basically, and once we'll it's moved it. to the central storage or it's considered standard hazardous waste. But a key thing with the accumulation start date, you want to have that on there because depending on the size generator you are, um, you may have only certain, you know, like if you're a large quantity generator, you got 90 days to kind of move this stuff out. If you're a small quantity generator, you got to 180 days. That accumulation start date just lets you know, you know, when you started accumulating waste into that container, and then you can manage things appropriately from there. Then within our storage areas, hazardous waste storage areas, it's important to have leak proof containers. Uh, we see that these are up on a containment pallet. That's another very good control to have in place. The labels are readily visible, so we don't have to spin the drum around or walk around to the other side. We can actually see it from where we are. Uh, we would separate anything that's incompatible from one another. And we wanna make sure that there's adequate aisle space so we have room to number one move. And then also we wanna make sure that they're protected from damage, especially say forklift damage, something like that. And we just wanna make sure that they're handled in a manner that will avoid any potential leaks or spills. And in Minnesota, uh, the, those ins inspection of that area needs to be done on a weekly basis. Yeah, I mean, these inspections basically help to ensure that you're complying with any requirements related to the storage of the waste. And then, you know, and some of the requirements may differ in Minnesota versus uh, states that just have to rely on federal requirements. But um, really, regardless of what size generator you are, whether you're a very small quantity generator or a large quantity generator, I mean, you should still have some pre-planning done. Like for a very small quantity generator in Minnesota, there's going to still be some minimum requirements for planning ahead for any kind of emergency incident, you know, just having equipment on hand to contain the spill, having means to report it right away, you know, that should all be part of your pre-planning. You know, a large quantity generator, um, you're going to have to have a full-blown contingency plan. You're going to have to have an emergency coordinator designated, and you know, you're going to have to make sure that you've got emergency numbers posted, you know, the whole works. So you're going to have a full-blown plan in place to ensure that you can respond promptly and appropriately to any kind of emergency incident. Okay, um, that that summarizes, you know, that pretty much wraps up what we wanted to try to cover. It was a lot of information. So again, if you do have questions, use the chat box. Um, you know, hopefully we covered information that was, you know, helpful for you. Um, Mike and Dave, we do have one question. Oh, yes. Would it be possible to get a list of acronyms used in this presentation? Um, we could certainly do that. We could figure out a way to, you know, get it out to those that uh, participated, I would think. Um, yeah, yeah. there's no shortage of acronyms. It's enough to make your head spin and give you a headache, to be quite honest. Um, I, re I remember someone giving me this big handout of all the federal acronyms, and it was kind of as a joke because it's, yeah, they're all over the place. But um, 
Yeah, I might even have that that I could share, but we could probably do that. We can go through the presentation. Yeah. And yeah. But again, you know, if there are questions, feel free to contact myself or Mike. Um, you might have questions come up afterwards. Just let us know. We'll get an answer for you. Um, and I guess, um, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Um, I think there was a survey that was um, available. So yeah, feel feel free. Please let us know. Love your feedback. You know, what you thought of this presentation. You know, hopefully we hit the mark, but let us know if we did or didn't. You know, it'll help us down the road. And then, you know, visit our website. We, we have other webinars up and coming. So visit the website to check the schedule for 2022. And again, thanks for, thanks for uh, tuning in. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. That concludes today's webinar. If I can, if you haven't already, please um, fill out the poll and have yourself a great day. Thank you. Thank you. At the time, it's a cool crap time to speed up the talk. But I think we hit it pretty close. It was probably closer to an hour, but I think we hit it okay. Yeah. Yeah, we were maybe two, three minutes over. Is that all? Oh, okay. That wasn't too bad. Yeah. I was kind of keeping track of the time up there because I kind of remembered when we started. And I thought, okay, I didn't want to get too.